He is one of the most famous and infamous men of the Civil War. His hard war tactics made Southerners revile him, but those same tactics led to a quicker end to the war. He is William Tecumseh Sherman. Welcome to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and in this video, I have part one of a series about the capture of Atlanta, Georgia by the Union Army under General Sherman. The letter I'm about to read to you gives an intimate look at how Sherman viewed war, the country, and Southerners. Some things you may be surprised about, and some you may have expected, but it is nevertheless fascinating. It is addressed to the mayor of Atlanta and the city council after the citizens of the city pleaded with him not to make them leave their homes. To James M. Calhoun, Headquarters, Military Division of the Mississippi, in the field, Atlanta, September 12, 1864. I have your letter of the 11th in the nature of a petition to revoke my orders removing all the inhabitants from Atlanta. I have read it carefully and give full credit to your statements of the distress that will be occasioned by it, and yet shall not revoke my orders, simply because my orders are not designed to meet the humanities of the case, but to prepare for the future struggles in which millions, yea, hundreds of millions of good people outside of Atlanta have a deep interest. We must have peace, not only in Atlanta, but in all America. To secure this, we must stop the war that now desolates our once happy and favored country. To stop war, we must defeat the rebel armies that are arrayed against the laws and constitution which all must respect and obey. To defeat those armies, we must prepare the way to reach them and their recesses provided with the arms and instruments which enable us to accomplish our purpose. Now, I know the vindictive nature of our enemy and that we may have many years of military operations from this quarter and therefore deem it wise and prudent to prepare in time. The use of Atlanta for the warlike purposes is inconsistent with its character as a home for families. There will be no manufactures, commerce, or agriculture here for the maintenance of families, and sooner or later, want will compel the inhabitants to go. Why not go now when all the arrangements are completed for the transfer instead of wait until the plunging shot of contending armies will renew the scenes of the past month? Of course, I do not apprehend any such thing at this moment, but you do not suppose this army will be here till the war is over. I cannot discuss this subject with you fairly because I cannot impart to you what I propose to do, but I assert that my military plans make it necessary for the inhabitants to go away. I can only renew my offer of service to make their exodus in any direction as easy and comfortable as possible. You cannot qualify a war in harsher terms than I will. War is cruelty, and you cannot refine it, and those who brought war into our country deserve all the curses and maledictions a people can pour out. I know I had no hand in making this war, and I know I will make more sacrifices today than any of you to secure peace. But you cannot have peace and a division of the country. If the United States submits to a division now, it will not stop but will go on till we reap the fate of Mexico, which is eternal war. The United States does and must assert its authority wherever it once had power. If it relaxes one bit to pressure, it is gone. I know that such is the national feeling. This feeling assumes various shapes, but always comes back to that of union. Once admit the union, once more acknowledge the authority of the national government, and instead of devoting your houses and streets and roads to the dread uses of war, I and this army become at once your protectors and supporters, shielding you from danger. Let it come from what quarter it may. I know that a few individuals cannot resist a torrent of error and passion such as swept the South into rebellion. But you can part out, so that we may know those who desire a government and those who insist on war and its desolation. You might as well appeal against the thunderstorm as against these terrible hardships of war. They are inevitable, and the only way the people of Atlanta can hope once more to live in peace and quiet at home is to stop the war, which alone 
can be done by admitting that the war began in error and is perpetrated in pride. We don't want your blacks or your horses or your houses or your lands or anything you have, but we do want and will have a just obedience to the laws of the United States that we will have and if it involves the destruction of your improvements, we cannot help it. You have heretofore read public sentiment in your newspapers that live by falsehoods and excitement, and the quicker you seek for truth in other quarters, the better for you. I repeat then that by the original compact of government, the United States had certain rights in Georgia, which have never been relinquished and never will be that the South began the war by seizing forts, arsenals, mints, customs houses, and etc. Long before Mr. Lincoln was installed, and before the South had one jot or tittle of provocation, I myself have seen in Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi hundreds and thousands of women and children fleeing from their armies and desperados, hungry and with bleeding feet. In Memphis, Vicksburg, and Mississippi, we fed thousands upon thousands of the families of rebel soldiers left on our hands, and whom we could not see starve. Now that war comes home to you, you feel very different. You deprecate its horrors, but did not feel them when you sent carloads of soldiers and ammunition, molded shells and shot to carry on war into Kentucky and Tennessee, and desolate the homes of hundreds and thousands of people who only ask to live in peace at their old homes and under a government of their inheritance. But these comparisons are idle. I want peace and believe it can now only be reached through union and war. I will ever conduct war partly with a view to perfect and early success. But my dear sirs, when that peace do come, you may call on me for anything. Then will I share with you the last cracker and watch with you to shield your homes and families against danger from every quarter. Now you must go and take with you the old and feeble, feed and nurse them, and build for them in more quiet places proper habitations to shield them against the weather till the mad passions of men cool down and allow the union and peace once more settle over your old homes in Atlanta. Yours in haste, W.T. Sherman. I hope you enjoyed the reading. Sherman is much more complicated than people give him credit for, but his tenaciousness is what brought him repeated victory in war. Thank you all so much for watching. Please subscribe and check out the Patreon page to vote on the next animated battle map. I'll see you next time.